Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you so much. As you're being seated, I want to invite you to take your source of Scripture. Uh, it may be a Bible like mine or it may be electronic. And turn with me to the book of John chapter 5. As you're turning to John 5, let me just remind us as a church family uh, that today is the fifth anniversary of Patty Griffith, who's our uh, records and publications uh, administrative assistant. So when you see Patty, you let her know that you love and appreciate her and her service in our church and uh, five years of service and hopefully more to come. And so you let Patty know that. John chapter 5, we're going to look at the first 14 verses in just a few moments. I don't know if you've ever read through entirely the Gospel of John. If you were to ever do that, you'll discover that in John, the Apostle records seven miracles that the Lord Jesus Christ actually performed. He gives detail about all seven of those miracles. Now, a lot of people get caught up in miracles. They get caught up in stuff. They get caught up in fluff. But oftentimes, we don't look past the miracle and look at the truth, the biblical teaching that the Lord has for us. And so today, I want to unpack one of those miracles. I want you to believe the miracle because it really did happen. But I hope that it forces you to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ if you're here today and you don't know Him as your Lord and Savior. The miracles of our Lord show that not only does He have power over nature, but He has redeeming power. He has power over sin, over hell, over the grave for all who will receive Him. The miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ clearly uh, speak to us uh, today about the wonderful truths that God answers our deepest need. You know, a few Sundays ago, I started off, I was preaching a sermon on redemption, and I asked you, what is your greatest need? And I really ask you to ponder that because really, if we're honest, our needs are really, really deep. Uh, a lot of times we just think about surface things. But all of us, no matter what our age, no matter what our gender, we have some really, really deep needs in our life. So this morning, I want to ask you if you would to take your Bible, look with me as I read from the, new, uh, from the ESV version, and we're going to look at our text in John chapter 5, the first 14 verses. We're about to read about one of the miracles of God's grace. And I hope that we never forget the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, beginning in verse 1 of John 5, After these things, after this, was a feast to the Jews. Now, if you go back and read the first 13 verses, it'll tell you what happened prior. Jesus had physically healed an uh, unofficial son. And so that's what brings us to verse 14. After this, there was a feast to the Jews, and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Now, there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethsheda which was five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Well, uh, that's a no-brainer, is it not? Now, that's not written in Scripture. That's just me out loud. Yeah, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool where the water is stirred up. And while I'm trying to get there, another steps in before me. And Jesus said to him in verse 8, Get up and take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, he took up his mat, in other words, and he walked. Now here's where the trouble started for Jesus. Because look at the next few words. It was the Sabbath. <laughs> oh boy, a heap of trouble. Because all the religious people got their dandruff up right then, okay? You got it? So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath, and is it not lawful for you to take up your bed? But he answered him, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they answered him and said, who is the man who said this to you? Take up your bed and walk. And now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn. And there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you're well. Sin no more, and nothing worse will happen to you. For many years, a man by the name of Paul Anderson was known as the world's strongest man. In fact, Paul Anderson won an Olympic gold medal in 1956 in weightlifting. He's spoken about in the Guinness Book of World Records, and his feat that he's spoken about, and I'm not much of a weightlifter, but I'm just going to surmise that this is quite a feat. He lifted three tons of weight with his back. Anybody else here done that lately? 
Okay, so that's why he's in the Guinness Book of Records. He was a great Christian. He walked with the Lord. He had a vibrant testimony for what God had done in his life. But in his late 50s, Paul Anderson's kidneys began to fail him. At the age of 61, Paul Anderson died. The world's strongest man died. The world's strongest man couldn't keep his internal organs from failing. Now, I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer today, but I just want to share with you the truth of Scripture that if the Lord tarries, all of us are physically going to pass away. Amen. Hebrews 9. It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So the reality is, if the Lord tarries his return, one day a preacher will stand over your casket. Physically, your mortal body will be laid to rest, as Paul Anderson's was. Now, the most important concept this morning is not what's going to happen to your body. A few weeks ago, uh, you know that I was not here, and I was at Howard Payne University. I was running a camp called Super Summer. And while I was at Super Summer, I made my way over to Taylor Hall. Taylor Hall is where... All the basketball and football players stayed when I was there in 1983 and 84. And I went to my room. And I went to my room and then I went to the other end of the athletic dorm where I stayed. And I went to the room of Paul Cunningham, one of my best friends in high school, who was a football player and died while we were both freshmen at Howard Payne University. He played football, I played basketball. And he died of a massive heart attack on the football field. It was a reminder to me that if the Lord tarries, we're all going to physically be laid to rest. So today, the miracle is not what's going to happen to your body. The miracle is, as this man found, do you have the inner strength, the inner peace that only God can bring in your life to be spiritually well, to be spiritually healthy? And so this morning, if you're a note taker like I am, we're going to unpack this passage of Scripture. There's an outline uh, on you version. If you're doing that, there's an outline on the back of your worship folder. And today, we're going to talk about spiritual wellness. We're going to talk about spiritually being strong, being whole, being made well that comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the love of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to look at this passage with me. I want to always direct your attention back to the Bible. Take the word of God uh, for what it is and it's the truth. And The, the passage here talks about uh, Bethsaida. That's said many ways. Uh, uh, and, and I want you to know that back in biblical days, in this particular setting, that was a, a shallow end, and it had been dammed up so that water could pool, so that people who had herds or flocks could bring their sheep or their goats, and they could walk there. That's why if you look at your text, it's known as the sheep gate. Now, years after that, a group of people built a church there, a structure, a physical church, and it's called St. Anne's Church, and it was built as a memorial to this particular church miracle. Now, that church is there, and Terry and I have had the privilege of standing in there when you sent us to the Holy Lands a few years ago, and we were in there, and, and as we walked in, there were people that were just singing hymns and spiritual songs, and we chimed in, we joined them, and I told Don earlier, it's the most incredible acoustics that you would ever hear. And so that's just a sidebar. But St. Anne's Church is there, and, and at this pool, there were Porticos. There were colonnades. There were, there were different places where people who were lame, who were sick, who needed healing, they could come and lay there. And so that's the setting. That's what's going on here in the book of Matthew chapter 5. Now, look at your text with me again because we read about this man and, and what he did that day, what happened to him is he, has a, he had an incredible experience and received the mercy of God in a miraculous way. Now, according to this passage of Scripture and what we know in further study, at this particular pool, people who were handicapped, who were sick physically, they would come and lay there. And, and the, the Greek mythology said that once a year, through the spring water that came up, the sediments would surface, and there was a stirring of the water, and the people thought it was the angel of God. And the concept was, what their thoughts were, is if you could be the first one in the pool, when the stirring happened, you would receive physical healing. In other words, if you were the fortunate one to, and I don't mean this ugly, but get the picture, if you were the first one to flop in or muster your way, however, to the water, their thoughts were you would be healed. That was their Greek mythology. That's what they thought. 
And so this is what this man is doing. He's been laying here probably for 38 years. He couldn't move. He couldn't walk. He'd been sitting there, laying there on his bed, on his pallet, on his mat, waiting, trying to get to the pool before somebody else. Have you ever tried to get somewhere and someone beat you to it? Doesn't that just frustrate the hound dog out of you? It does me. I mean, I want to get there, and I want to get it first. That became real evident back during when COVID hit because uh, I would try to get to the toilet paper aisle before anybody else. <laughs> hey, that's essential when you have a house full of women, just saying. And somebody beat me there. Or I'd get there, and there was a limit on it. Somebody would get there before me and get the water or whatever. And sometimes in life, we try to be first. We want to get there first. But somebody beats us in. It's so frustrating. And I can just picture this man probably for 38 years on that one single solitary time where the sediment from the spring, so they thought, stirred the water so they thought, and you could be healed. He didn't even have enough strength to be first in the pool. Very discouraging. Now, the miracle has an incredible message. I want you to believe the miracle. It happened. But I want you to trust in Jesus. And I see in this passage, and I'll direct your attention back if you'll go with me back to verse 5. It's very interesting to me because in verse 5, the scripture says that Jesus fixed his eyes on one man. You see that? Jesus spotted. He made eye contact. He connected with one man out of probably hundreds. And he looked at that man. Because he had a purpose in mind. He wanted to speak biblical truth to his life and to my life and to your life today as well. And then look at verse 6 because it's the springboard. Jesus looked at this man. He's laying on one of the colonnades there at this pool. And he says to him this word. He asked this question. Out of all the questions Jesus could ask, he said, Sir, do you want to be healed? Well, that's a no-brainer. Yes. I'm here because I'm trying to be healed. For 38 years, in case you don't know, I haven't walked. I've never walked on my feet. I've never seen my legs function. And yes, I want to be healed. So the question that Jesus asked that paralyzed man that day, listen to me, look right here. Those of you on Facebook, don't tune me out yet. The same question is still being asked today. All of you. Visitors or members of life? Here's the question. Write it down. It's from verse 6. Do you want to be healed? Now, Brother Scott, I'm walking just fine. In fact, I'm so good in shape that CB invited me to go to youth camp and I was a bona fide sponsor. <laughs> I'm so good that I'm doing workouts with Coach Callaway and the staff every morning, Monday through Thursday this summer. Brother Scott, I'm so good, i got a, a fitness membership to any time or Planet Fitness or wherever, and I go work out every day. Why do you ask that question? And in fact, Brother Scott, I just went to my yearly exam and everything's good. My ticker's working well, all my enzymes are good, my blood count's good. Why do you ask that question? Why would Jesus ask that question still today? Because listen to me, a lot of people are spiritually sick. Amen. A lot of people today are spiritually paralyzed. There's a group of people, and possibly there's some here or some listening on the internet, if they haven't turned it off already, who are spiritually sick. They're lost without a Savior. They don't know Jesus personally. And then the second group is those of us who probably know Christ and have a relationship with Jesus, but, listen, we're not where we need to be spiritually. We're not where we used to be years ago. Maybe we used to be on fire for Jesus. We told our testimony. We witnessed to people years ago. But just with the hustle and bustle of even living in small town Bullard, we get so caught up in doing other stuff and getting our kids here and there. And other things have become our gods. And we're just not. So the question is, do you need to be healed? That's the question that's still relevant today. So I want us to look very quickly, three things, and I'm done, about this paralyzed man, 38 years, and his encounter with Jesus Christ. I want us to look at this miracle. Believe it. It's true. 
but trust in Jesus. The first thing that I see from this passage of Scripture is in verse 7. Today, the question is, do you want to be healed? And first of all, I think there are three things. First of all, you've got to admit your weakness. Now, here's the fact. All the people laying by the pool of Bethesda, they laid there indicating they were sick. Okay? You didn't just go to the pool of Bethesda to have a drink with an umbrella in it and hang out with your friends. You didn't go there to, I didn't bring my Mountain Dew up here, drink Mountain Dew, need sunflower seeds. You didn't go there to have sweet tea. You went there. The only reason you went there at this particular stage is not to water your goats or your livestock. Those days were over. The sheep gate days were over. You went there because in your mind you have believed for years that there was a stirring of the water on a particular day. The sediment from the spring would come and you thought, you were told that was when the angel of God showed up and you could be healed. And so these people that laid there, they admitted they were sick. How many of you, by show of hands, may go out to eat after church today? Can I see your hands? Because I want to see who's going. I might want to go with you. Come on. You're going out. Yeah. Why do you go? Because you're hungry. Somebody said, no, it's because my wife didn't cook. Well, he's going to need marriage counseling later in the week. So uh, you go there not just to see the new menu at the local restaurant or see if the prices have come down. They haven't. You go there because you're hungry. You want something to eat. Amen. And so these folks laying by the pool, they admitted their sinfulness. They admitted their weakness. Dear God, help us get to the point where we admit our need for a Savior. Dear God, help us who are believers who live in East Texas, where everybody's just good folk, admit that we still need you. Help us admit, God, even though it's a small town, everybody knows everybody's business, that we're not where we need to be spiritually. Help us admit. And there are three things that support this thing. First of all, look at this guy again and look at the source of his weakness. Now, in this particular passage, this man's spiritual paralysis was because of sin. You have your Bible, hold your finger where you are and go to the right very quickly to the book of John chapter 9. Would you go there with me very quickly? There's a misconception that's been prevalent in our society for years. And I want you to hear this from me. And I want you to see from God. There's a lot of people today who say, well, if you're sick, it's because of your sin. <laughs> okay, then we're all sick because we're all sinners. Can I get an amen out of that? Amen. <laughs> But some of you have been swept off your feet. Listen to me. I love you. You've been swept off your feet by a bunch of folks who believe heresy and are contradicting the Word of God. Oh, you'll be set free from your athlete's foot, I've been told, if you'll just confess all your sins. Oh, so-and-so's got the diagnosis of cancer because they're sinners. We're all sinners. Every last one of us. But if you've bought hook, line, and sinker that all of your illnesses are related to your sin. Then, then John chapter 9, verse 1 through 3 will set you back a step or two. Look at your text. As he passed by, this is another miracle that John wrote about. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Look what Jesus said in verse 3. It was not that this man sinned nor his parents. Why, did, why was he blind then? So that the works of God can be displayed in him. So, there's a source of weakness for this particular man. His spiritual weakness, and this is the illustration of the miracle, was sin. There's no doubt. He was a sinner. He was a sinner by birth. He was a sinner by nature, just like us. And he was a sinner by choice. And he was a sinner by practice, just like every last one of us. That's the source. Now look at your text back in John 5. The force of his weakness. This man was so weak that he was paralyzed. He was paralyzed. Romans chapter 5 verse 6. For while we were weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Folks, I don't have what it takes to be godly. I can't measure up. There's nothing that I can do on my own, but sin is the force that weakens my life. And then thirdly, what was the course of his weakness? When a person was paralyzed this long, I'm going to assume that his muscles had withered away. Have you ever had orthopedic surgery? 
Any of you? My mom just had hip replacement surgery about eight weeks ago. Thank you, Jesus, she finally did it. And she's been going through rehab. And what she discovered, and I'm seeing Brian back there because he's a physical therapist. When she went for all those months prior to surgery and after Brian originally, her muscles, just she lost strength. She had no strength in her muscles. So the goal now is, with the help of physical therapy, is to build those muscles back up. For 38 years, this guy's muscles didn't work. Had a coach in college that used to say, it takes a long time to get strong, but a short time to lose it. What does that mean? It takes you a long time to lift weights and build up strength. But if you go just a few weeks without doing it, you lose all that muscle. This man for 38 years, muscles withered away. Probably non-existent. Just laid there, laid on his pallet, laid on his bed. He was weak. In the same way, people who are here today without Jesus Christ, as time goes on, they become weak. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, my prayer is today that you would invite him to be your Savior. For those of you who walk with Jesus already, but maybe you're not fully serving him as you once did or you want to or as he wants you to, my prayer is that you would confess that and allow him, as you go deeper in his word, to renew your spiritual strength. Amen. So when I look at this guy in John 5, he admitted his sin. Secondly, look at verse 6. If you're spiritually weak, if you're spiritually lost, not only admit your sin, not only admit your shortcomings, your weaknesses, but engage your will. Look at verse 6. Jesus asked the man if he wanted to be healed. Jesus basically was saying, hey, what do you want to do in this situation? You're laying here on a pallet. It's the Sabbath. There's a whole bunch of other folks that I could pick, but I chose you. I'm looking at you. So what do you want to do? Do you want me to go to someone else? Do you want me to just leave? What do you want? In other words, I want to engage you. You know, folks, Jesus Christ never forces himself upon you. Let me just quickly share with you some of the promises of Scripture. It's God's desire that all men, women, boys, and girls, come to a saving knowledge of him. The Bible says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which the Bible goes on to say that Jesus knocks at the door of your heart. And if you'll open that door, he'll come in and he'll sup with you. He'll camp out with you. He'll have Amen. supper with you. And he'll stay with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. There are promises upon promises upon promises of promises. Invitation after invitation after invitation. That Jesus Christ wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to engage you. Jesus asked this man, do you want to be healed? Now, in the original text, the original Greek, what Jesus was asking is this. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made full? You see, there's a huge difference. There's not a person in this room today that if you have an ailment, a sickness, a disease, th there's not anybody to say, Bro, Scott, I don't want to be healed. But Jesus wants to do more than just heal your physical. Jesus wants to make you whole. Jesus wants to make you complete. Jesus is offering today to, to bring fullness of life to you. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it how? Abundantly. To the max. To the fullest. And so Jesus was trying to engage this man. Sir, do you want me to heal you? What do you want me to do for you? He was trying to engage his will. Notice Jesus didn't ask the man, Hey, sir, uh, I know there's a bunch of you here, but do you want to walk today? He didn't say that, did he? He said, do you want to be healed? You see, believe in the miracle, but trust in Jesus because there's a more powerful message. Listen, I love the fact that I get to walk. Friday night, Terry and I, Megan, had dinner with Ira and Judy Sansom. Years ago, she was my administrative assistant at First Baptist Church of Wiley when I was a youth pastor. One Sunday night, during church, while Ira and Judy were off serving a camp, her son, Tress, at his girlfriend's house, not in the Lord's house where he should have been, where he needed to be, where his parents thought he was, he dove off the diving board in a swim pool. And still to this day, however many years later, he's a quadriplegic. 
I don't know of another guy that would rather walk than Tress Sanson. Had just graduated high school 10 days later, found himself confined until this very day to a wheelchair. But Tress Sanson will tell you, I'm whole. Yeah, I'd like to walk, but more importantly than that, I'm whole. Jesus has brought fullness of life to me because I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Engage your will. Admit that you're a sinner. Thirdly, admit your weakness. Number four, initiate your walk. Remember the miracles of Jesus written in the Gospel of John. They were written to teach us spiritual lessons. They were written so that you and I can know more about Jesus Christ and so that we can have a personal relationship with Him. And if you look at your text, it says that immediately the man gathered his bed and walked out. I want to say this to you, and I'll wrap up with this. If you're here today and you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm not talking about where you go to church. I don't care about that. I'm talking about something more important than church membership, believe it or not. You don't hear me preachers say that, right? More important than church membership. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Because it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And just because I'm the pastor at First Baptist Board, it's not going to cut the mustard in heaven. But do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? And, and this man said, and he believed, and he admitted, and immediately the Scripture says... He was made whole. Whole. If you're here today and you're out the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior, the question still is offered today. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be complete? If the answer in your heart is yes, Jesus immediately will give you life everlasting. For those of you who are here today and maybe you walk with Jesus Christ, but your walk is not as effective or as intentional or purposeful as it once was. Jesus is asking you the same question. Do you want to be whole? Do you want me to restore the vibrancy and the liberty of your Christian walk? I will do it. And I will do it immediately as soon as you ask. As you engage with me, I'll fulfill my promise.